What's going on, y'all, and welcome to another great edition of the Bombastic Podcast, hosted by Andrew Ellis, yours truly, and presented by Natty State Sports, the best damn baseball podcast you've ever heard, uh, your absolute go-to source for everything Arkansas baseball-related. Um, guys, we got a lot to get into. The world is a lot different than it was the last time we spoke, which was, I guess, Wednesday. Uh, a lot has happened. Arkansas had a productive road trip to Auburn, I would say, in my humble opinion. Uh, might not have blown everyone away. Wasn't you know a dominant sweep or anything, but they got the series win on the road, which you really can never complain about. At least I'm not going to. And uh, I'm sure you guys have your opinions and all that, and I look forward to hearing them, as I always do. Um, but we're going to get into all of that. we got a lot to talk about. Uh, Dave Van Horn is now a grandfather, so congratulations to him. Congratulations to his daughter, Holland. I believe it's Jacob is the name of the the, the, the father of the children. Triplets, which is crazy. You know, I mean, like, if you're going to be a first-time grandparent, first-time parent, triplets is a, is a wild way to, to hop right into it. But, you know, congrats to them. Really good to see that. And, and DVH obviously was there made the trip all the way, missed Saturday, or Friday's game for Arkansas because he was there to, to be there for his you know his, his daughter and his grandkids. So good for them, happy for them. We'll talk about that a little bit, I guess, but we'll really just talk about the baseball, what was going on this weekend, plenty to get into. But we got to start the show like we do every time where I have to just remind you of all the tremendous and brilliant things we're doing here at Natty State Sports. I, of course, have to start with Curtis and Scotty because they've been absolutely crushing it, uh, despite the fact that the Arkansas basketball team has not been crushing it. Uh, their season is now obviously over. Eric Musselman, everyone's got a lot of questions. Transfer portal, Arkansas is pretty much, and when I say pretty much, they have like nobody returning. A um, lot of questions for the Arkansas basketball team. Curtis and Scotty have the answer to all of them. They've cranked out five podcasts in five days, I believe, at least. And then they cranked one out yesterday, too. I mean, like they're they're just pumping out content right now. Uh, nobody's doing what they're doing now, on the basketball front. Those guys are killing it. They're going to continue to. So make sure you're subscribed over there at the main Natty State Sports YouTube channel, as well as this YouTube channel that you are watching now, the Bombastic Podcast. By the way, we were looking at some numbers. Some of you, some of you folks just watch this show and don't subscribe. We know. We see. We see the numbers of how many people are subscribed, how many people are watching. Uh, it doesn't add up. So a lot of anybody, anybody here watching that's not subscribed, what are you doing? You know, maybe if you think the show sucks, that's that's absolutely possible. You're you're allowed to not subscribe under those circumstances. But if you're watching every week and you're you're you love the Arkansas baseball team and you know you like hearing what I have to say or just like you know hearing some discussion on Arkansas baseball, what are you doing? Why are you not subscribed to this YouTube channel? Um, also, if you've not already, go ahead and subscribe on your podcast platforms, whether wherever you get them. Uh, I don't even know all the names of where the podcast is available, but it's we were looking at some numbers today. There's like Podbean. We have some people listening on that, Amazon Music, uh, some dude listening on iTunes. I don't know how you do that, but also you have your Apple, your Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast, uh, be sure to subscribe to the Bombastic Podcast and its feed on wherever it is you get it because it's available everywhere. Uh, and all the other good stuff we've got going on at Natty State Sports. Boss Hawks Podcast put out another episode last week. I believe they're coming in to record something here in the next couple days. Really fun, but also, guys, I want to let you know about something some stuff we have coming up in terms of live shows. So we have a deal we just got with Twin Peaks. Ever heard of them? Uh, tremendous sports bar and grill. And, uh, you know, the views are nice there. Everyone knows that. Um, but we we will be doing a live show Thursday night, uh, which is also the time that Arkansas and LSU are playing baseball. I'm obviously going to be leaving at some point to go to that. But we're going to be doing a live John Neighbors show from Twin Peaks in Rogers, four to six this Thursday. Um, and then I believe Curtis, Scotty, and John, whenever I leave and go to the Arkansas baseball game, which, you know, if you're, if you're a, a real astute person who loves the Hogs and you, you want to watch Arkansas beat LSU like I do, um, you'll be watching, paying attention to that. But if you're not going to the game and you want to just watch it somewhere, Twin Peaks is a great place to watch it. Like I said, John, Curtis, and Scotty will be there. I will be there for a few hours before I leave. Um, so come hang out with us. Come get a drink. Uh, Twin Peaks, underrated appetizers. I'll tell you that. This is not an ad read, by the way. This is not an ad read, but Twin Peaks, great appetizers, underrated, just underrated food, but it's a nice little atmosphere, cool little spot there in Rogers right off the highway. Um, so if you're in the area, if you live out there, you live in Fayetteville, wherever, 
come check us out. Come say what's up to us. Uh, we're going to be having a good time watching some NCAA tournament games, doing the John Neighbor Show, watching Arkansas beat LSU, all of the above. Uh, so we look forward to that. And if you can't make it to that one, and if you're maybe in the Little Rock area and you're like, oh, I live in Little Rock, I can't make it up for that one, you're in luck because the day that Arkansas plays in Little Rock, their annual baseball game that they play in Dickey Stevens Park, that day we are going to be doing a live show at the Twin Peaks in Little Rock. So that's going to be really cool. We look forward to kind of getting down there because I know we have a, a nice little fan base there, like a, a nice little subscriber base in Little Rock. So we want to go see those people. We're going to be doing kind of like a tour day Little Rock where – few other events there. I believe that Wednesday, the day after the game. Uh, I forget the name of the place that we're going, but we're having another live show there. Um, there's just a lot of stuff. So we're going to be out and about. So be on the lookout for us. Um, and if you you know, if you know like what we're doing, you want to come say what's up, come do that. And uh, if nothing else, just come hang out at Twin Peaks, enjoy some food, watch some ball, uh, enjoy enjoy the views. It's great, man. It's good stuff. Um, so we're looking forward to that. That's, that's all very exciting stuff. And I look forward to seeing some of you guys there. I also just want to get this. I just want to get this out there. I know I'm like six minutes in. We haven't even talked baseball yet, but I do just want to kind of throw this out here because I like hearing you guys' feedback. And uh, at my previous employer, I like worked for a message board, so I constantly had people telling me what they liked, what they didn't like, what they hate about me, what they think I could do better, like whatever. You just always had that feedback, and while I don't miss that at all, um, like really like at all, I do kind of miss mixing it up and talking ball with some guys. Um, so I appreciate anybody who comments and you know gives their thoughts or asks the question or whatever. I've said it before. I'll say it now. Like I don't ever want you guys to not know something, you know, about this Arkansas baseball team. Like simply, like I, obviously, you know, there's always going to be plenty of unanswered questions, things we wonder about. But I want you guys to like view this as a place you can talk about that kind of stuff. Uh, but I also want to just float this on your radars. I haven't even talked to my bosses about this. So I probably should have before. What do you guys think about me doing the Bombastic Podcast live? Would that be something y'all are into? Again, like if it is, let me know in the comments below or reach out, whatever you got to do. If not, just, you know, ignore me and let me get to the baseball here in a couple minutes here. Um, but I was just wondering, like, would that be, you know, we do a lot of live shows here. Like, and when I say live shows, not at a place. Although, who knows? You know, local businesses hit me up. Um, but I just mean literally like doing it going live to where there's a chat, there's a Q&A, like y'all can ask questions, y'all can throw your comments or whatever, like as it's happening. Uh, maybe we do it at like lunchtime or whatever. I'm not opposed to doing a night one, but let me guys know what you think. Let me know what you guys think. I worded that one really weird. Um, but yeah, just let me know. If that's something you're into, hit me up and let me know. I would, uh, I'm kind of tinkering with how to make this show better. And we always want to improve. We want your feedback. We're trying to tailor to you our fans or our listeners or whatever, like we want you to enjoy this. We want you to get what you want out of this. So, hey, we're open to hearing all those ideas, so I really appreciate it. And uh, since we're talking about people that we like and that support us, got to shout out our boys, Signature Bank, the community-driven, high-functioning, best bank ever. I love Signature Bank. Uh, I really do. I, I don't know if anybody's ever seen How I Met Your Mother. Uh I, I, when there's an episode where Barney Stinson, when the main character gets a job at a bank or his his company that he works for starts working for a bank, and he's like wearing the bank shirt and he's just ramping them up. That's kind of how I feel. But I've been, I've recently been been using Signature Bank. Got me a nice little credit card there. Love Signature Bank. I could not vouch for these guys more. Um, like I said, they're like community banking at its best. There, that's kind of their their mantra is that they they are kind of the the Dunder Mifflin, if you will, of like resources and they feel like a high level big time business minded bank that is going to have all your resources that you would need can answer any questions you have but they're all over the state of Arkansas serving their communities uh, not just Fayetteville not just Rogers not just Little Rock like they got them all over the state of Arkansas so go check out their website uh, that is www.signature.bank that's where you can check those guys out if you have any, you know, banking issues or whatever, I'm not saying you should go into debt just to use Signature Bank, but if you have any situation, if you're trying to open up an account, trying to merge stuff like, uh, you know, manage your wealth and whatever, they have options for everything. Go check those guys out, www.signature.bank. We appreciate all they do for us here at Natty State Sports. Uh, I was rocking this awesome Signature Bank shirt on, on Saturday. It's like white. Got like the it's like the state it says signature bank up here and then on the back it's like the state of Arkansas it's kind of got like a little red white and blue it's just, it was great got like three compliments on it so if nothing else they make really good t-shirts but 
Let's just get into some baseball. And hey, before I talk about Arkansas, I do want to just take a quick little peek around the SEC because I don't know if you guys have been paying attention or if you've just been watching Arkansas or just kind of, you know, still in basketball mode a little bit. But dude, the SEC baseball is freaking unreal, man. Like the results every week are kind of baffling. So like last week was obviously the first week. So we're still at a small sample size here. But like a lot of the teams that had productive weeks last week or teams that we thought sucked last week, it's been very much all over the place. Uh, we'll just kind of go through the results here. So obviously Arkansas was at Auburn. They win their series two out of three. We will talk about that. Um, A&M hosted Mississippi State. Now Mississippi State was coming off of a big home series win over LSU. They took two out of three. They go to A&M, who had lost a series at Florida two out of three. Um, and they kind of flipped it there. So A&M was at home. They win the series two out of three. Seemed like a pretty competitive series for the most part. I didn't watch a ton of those games because they were happening right at the same time. But it seemed like it was pretty pretty close for the most part. I think both of those teams are going to be a force to be reckoned with. You know, I think they're both properly rated. Like Mississippi State's 15. I believe A&M was like that. See, they were seven going into the week. I think both of those are pretty accurate there. Um, Tennessee who dropped a home series to, or no, dropped a road series at Alabama last week, lost two out of three. They returned home and beat the absolute piss out of Ole Miss two out of three. Now I will say two out of three, they didn't sweep them, but the two games that they won were 15 to three and like 14 to two or something like that. Like they hammered them. Uh, but Ole Miss was able to salvage that Saturday game, uh, get in there. But Ole Miss was coming off of a big series win against South Carolina. So you see a theme here of a lot of like kind of just up and down with some of these teams. Uh, makes you feel a little bit more appreciative of Arkansas just being 5-1 and one and having not lost a series all year. You'd much rather be in that situation. Uh, Got to mention gotta mention our boys uh, at Missouri. I, so they, they didn't win the series at Kentucky. They hosted Kentucky, who, by the way, swept Georgia last week. Um, and we'll get to Georgia later, but Kentucky was coming off of, you know, they're 19-3, and three, or they were 18-3 and three going into the weekend. So I guess now they're 20-4. and four. Um, but they were coming into this weekend carrying a lot of momentum. They go to 11 innings on Friday night with Missouri and end up winning 9-4. to four. Not not often you see an extra inning game uh, end up with a five-run deficit, but that game was a lot closer than the final score indicates. Uh, so that was pretty crazy. Uh, Pimentel, the great Missouri pitcher that kind of shut down Arkansas, he shut down Kentucky. They were able to steal that Saturday game and force a rubber match, which Kentucky won. I think it was like 6-5 to five or 7-6, to six, but... That was like the closest. I mean, Arkansas and Auburn was obviously very close. That was like the closest series of the weekend. Missouri and Kentucky were like neck and neck. Now, obviously, it was at Missouri, at Como. So, it, you know, Kentucky winning the series on the road, like you're, you're fine with that. But it's like, man, that, was, that showed you Missouri's like maybe not as garbage as we thought. Uh, and, you know, maybe they are a real SEC team. They now have one SEC win, so good for them. Uh, LSU, so LSU and Florida was kind of the marquee series that we talked about last week. LSU wins the first game six to one at home. Uh, Luke Holman had like eleven strikeouts. He was he was awesome in that game. Uh, Florida Florida's Friday night starter I forget his name Fish something Fisher. He's been really struggling. He has like an eighty RA. LSU was able to get to him. They take game one six to one. They go into extras on Saturday and Jack Caglione ever heard of him hits a huge two run home run that gives Florida the win. So LSU loses like a tough extra innings game in game two forces a rubber match in Florida just whooped them it was 12 to 2 on Sunday not really competitive at all so LSU is now dropped back-to-back -back series to start SEC play they were able to win a game in both but they're two and four as they turn their attention to the number one ranked Arkansas Razorbacks where they will be visiting Fayetteville this weekend and we will have plenty on that series coming in the next few days uh, but yeah, just kind of eye on the defending national champions. They're now two and four in SEC play. Uh, not great. Um, that Georgia team that I mentioned that Kentucky swept, they swept Alabama this week at home. And Alabama beat Tennessee two out of three. So you're starting to see like it's just all over the place here. And also South Carolina, who got beat two out of three by Ole Miss, they sweep Vandy at home after Vandy swept. Auburn and beat him pretty good last week looked really good and you're thinking oh Vandy's really trading this way Auburn maybe not that great Auburn looked pretty competent against Arkansas I would say like you know obviously they're one and five now through two weekends but that Auburn team I didn't get the vibe that you know they were like uncompetitive or weren't gonna you know be able to hold their own in the SEC I think they're gonna be fine uh but Vandy sweeps them and so you're feeling good about them and then they just get swept by South Carolina on the road 
So it, like I said, it's kind of all over the place here with some of these SEC results so far. Um, and Arkansas being 5-1, and one, I mean, it's hard to complain too much about that. Uh, Arkansas is now a full two games in front of everyone else in the West. Uh, Auburn's 1-5. Bama and LSU are 2-4. and four. Ole Miss, Mississippi State, and A&M all 3-3. Three and three. Um, on the east side, Kentucky 5-1. and one. They're leading the charge there. South Carolina 4-2 and two, despite losing a series to Ole Miss last week. Florida's 4-2. and two. They've had two really impressive series wins. They're the team, I would say, if you're you know just forecasting, they're the team I would say Arkansas has to look out for. If you're trying to win the SEC regular season title, and hell, if you're trying to win the national title, you're probably going to have to answer for Florida. But uh, I just wanted to catch you guys up a little bit on what's been going on around the SEC because obviously Arkansas is going to play a lot of these teams, uh, and these, these series have a lot of implications dealing with the Razorbacks. And so it's just kind of always – Fun to see how that plays out and see what it, what it looks like. Um, but so let's get into Arkansas's game. So Thursday night, Arkansas wins one to nothing, and I think Thursday night just kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of just how valuable Hagen Smith is. Uh, I mean, it's hard to ask for much more. He ends up going six innings in this game, strikes out twelve, gives up three hits and two walks, which like both of those I think were like season highs, uh, the hits and the walks. Um, but man, I mean, he was, just, he just held down Auburn. Uh, they weren't able to get any momentum strung together. Uh, Ross Lovich made a really bad error at one point. I believe it might've been in the fifth inning, uh, where Arkansas had one out runners on, I think maybe I think just a runner on first. I don't know if he had issued a walk or whatever. Ross Lovich just straight up drops a fly ball, which, you know, puts runners at second and third with nobody out. I believe Hagan even walked another guy. So you ended up having a bases loaded one out situation or bases loaded or two or second and third one out some type of situation the bases ended up being loaded uh and Hagen just strikes out the next two guys just does what he has to do um but it was cool to see him overcome something like that I mean obviously you don't want to see your left fielder drop a fly ball uh, and he was kind of up near against the fence but you know kind of a, a a big mistake that typically teams make you pay for especially teams in the SEC and uh, Auburn made Arkansas pay for some mistakes later in the weekend, which we'll get to. But I just thought that like that moment right there just says a lot about Hagen and kind of just how fearless the dude is. And he just he just goes out there and attacks man. He's like a robot. He's like a Terminator up there on the mound. And uh, always good to see him like show some emotion and really get into it. Um, Hagen is just doing some crazy stuff. So I mean, if we're gonna look at his overall season numbers to this point now, so we are looking at Hagen has a one two four ERA. He's four and zero. 62 strikeouts in 29 innings. We've we've talked about his strikeouts per nine a lot. Uh, my math, I don't have it pulled up in front of me, and I can't do the math there. That's like 18, 19 an inning, though, I believe. I mean, 29 times two is 58. He's at definitely two an inning, which would be 18. Over to, I mean, that's legit still around that 19, 20 range of strikeouts per nine innings. Dude, this is unreal. This is like, you know, this is Kevin Copps like, this is Paul Skeens like, whatever whatever the best pitcher you've seen of the last 20 years, that's how good Hagen Smith is. And uh, it seems like he's almost getting a little bit better. I mean, he's, he, has, he's, he hasn't given up a run in SEC play. Um, dude's just been lights out. I mean, we knew he was good, but I think that people are, you know, David Horn said last week, I don't think people understand what they're watching when it comes to Hagen Smith. I think people are starting to understand what they're watching. Um, I, I remember a few weeks ago texting my dad, and I was like, I never thought that I would see a better pitcher at Arkansas than what Kevin Copps was in 2021. Or I just never thought like that season and the way it played out. And obviously, this is a very different situation. It's like apples to oranges comparing a Friday night starter to a reliever, a souped up reliever who was making all these appearances and throwing four innings on Friday and then three on Sunday or whatever. So you can, you know, that's for y'all to argue who's better or what you think or like which one you'd rather have. We can have that debate if you want. All I know is that Hagen Smith is absolutely that good, like that he's on that level, that echelon. I mentioned Paul Skeens. Like I remember in the fall, Matt Hobbs saying that like behind closed doors, Hagen's stuff was as good or if not better than what Paul Skeens had because obviously they have the track man, they have the, the data, they are able to kind of analyze that stuff. And they were in the offseason, they were saying Hagen's stuff is every bit as good as Paul Skeens. I mean, he he has been. He's been he's been as good as Paul Skeens on the mound, and obviously Paul Skeens threw more pitches or threw more innings, was a little bit more of a workhorse. And so we'll see. Hagen's now made three starts of six or more innings this year through his first six. 
Um, so we'll see. I mean, seems like he's on track for a lot of stuff. That dude's going to make a lot of money. Uh, but I, I think at this point, every weekend, Hagan Smith is appointment television. You you got to clear your schedule, whether it's a Thursday, Friday, if, or if the game gets moved out to Saturday. Like You need to be clearing out your schedule to make sure you watch Hagan Smith because we don't know how many more outings we got with this kid. And uh, it's been special, man. And got to shout out Will McIntyre. We got to give him some flowers because he came in and threw two scoreless innings in that Friday game, which again ended up one nothing. Uh, they made an interesting decision. I don't. I mean, interesting isn't that. It's, it wasn't that interesting. Uh, they, you know, Will had his two quick innings. I think he threw like 22, 23 pitches, and then going to the ninth, they went ahead and gave the ball to Gackle one to nothing. He had obviously been the closer to this point. Uh, you know, but I just that was one of the questions I had of like, hey, how do we feel about Gabe Gackle in these SEC settings? He comes in and gets two quick strikeouts, retires a side in order. Uh, no big deal. Arkansas wins one to nothing. And, uh, you know, every team, every good team at Arkansas over the last however many years, you kind of have a little bit of a formula. Like I think back to 2018 when you had Blaine Knight would throw you six innings, give up like two runs. Then you'd go to either Rindle or Lowski and then have Cronin finish it up. In 2019, it was like Campbell to, you know, Costi Shock, Scroggins, maybe Cops, uh, or Ramage was thrown in there a little bit, kind of all setting up to get to Cronin. Uh, every team kind of had their formula of like Friday nights when the scores are low, when it's high leverage, all nine innings are high leverage innings. Like, how do you, what do you do there? Uh, now we'll see if it's this same exact formula every time. Obviously, it was Hagen six. Will McIntyre two, Gabe Yakel one, but it's just cool to see the makings of that formula starting to play out right in front of our eyes. But we just got to give Will McIntyre his flowers, man. I mean, he's he's been absolutely lights out this year for the year. He's got a one five seven ERA, uh, thirty two strikeouts. He's he's one out behind Hagen Smith for the team lead in innings. He's got one more out than Brady Tiger. Brady Tiger's at twenty eight point one. McIntyre 28.2, Hagan at 29, and Mason Molina at 28. So those are your top four pitchers. They're pretty much, he has a starter's workload. I mean, pretty much at this point. I mean, he threw, I guess, only three innings this weekend. So, I mean, I don't know what, what if he was just, you know, too bored or what, but three high leverage innings, got the save on in uh, Friday's game, which we'll talk about Friday's game a little bit. One of the most chaotic baseball games I've ever seen. But before we do that, I just want to, to make sure that we give Will McIntyre his proper due. Dude's been killing it. And uh, when you really just take into account his whole story at Arkansas and how it's played out, it's one of the cooler things that I've seen as a fan or as a journalist, as a whatever, like being around this Arkansas baseball team and watching Will McIntyre's whole story play out has been one of the more enjoyable things I've experienced. Like, honestly, like just, I remember when he first started playing in 2020, and being like, holy cow, like they're gonna have this random dude from Bryant is gonna be like their midweek starter. He's gonna be like a dude for them. He might, you know, he might help them down the stretch. Then obviously COVID happens. Will comes back that offseason and he'll tell you himself that he wasn't in the best mind frame physically, uh, mentally, just wasn't wasn't, you know, ready to contribute at that point in time. Red shirts in 2021. Uh, he's kind of sitting around waiting for his turn. Has a pretty good summer. Uh, the Northwoods League that summer, but then he comes back in 2022 and then doesn't pitch for the first like two months of the year. It's like mid-April by the time he had not pitched at all. And uh, he goes into a midweek start and it's like pretty much now or never. It's like if he sucks, if he would have sucked in that start, who knows what happens? You know, he probably doesn't pitch the rest of that year and then probably ends up moving on or doing something else uh, to see the way his career has played out now to where in 2022, by the end of that year, he was as valuable as anyone on the roster, has an iconic performance in Omaha to save Arkansas from elimination. Uh, really, at that point, it kind of won over the fans and the coaches, for sure, and just kind of was clearly a dude that you knew you could trust. Uh, and then 2023 was kind of an up-and-down year, but by the end of that year, uh, he was obviously kind of found something in the bullpen. I felt like you could kind of tell, like, you know, maybe, you know, because he had started games and had a lot of success midweek in Omaha on the weekends, like, had kind of been a great starter for Arkansas because you could see how many pitches he can throw. But I think they figured out last year down the stretch that, hey, maybe using this dude as a, like, Kevin Copps type of role of using him multiple times on the weekend, coming in in high leverage spots, because, I mean, the dude's fearless. I think they figured out this is maybe the right role for him. And once they did, he was awesome down the stretch last year, for those who don't remember. Um and then this year, I mean, he's been even better. This is pretty much the best year of his career so far. So it's like he just keeps building. Uh, I think by the time Will McIntyre is done, I think we should all look back on his time very fondly. I really do. And uh, 
you know, really good to see that. Good to see that for him and his family that he continues to just be a dude for Arkansas. I mean, he's as valuable as anyone in this Arkansas bullpen. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the struggles that the rest of the bullpen faced on Saturday without him. And that sort of just puts a light on how valuable he really is. But uh, let's talk about game two. Because I feel like this was the game of the series. I mean, it was the best game of the weekend by far, in my opinion, even though watching Hagen was cool. And then, you know, Auburn fans would probably tell you game three was cool because they came back and scored six runs in that one inning. So that was awesome. Uh, but I thought Friday was like one of the best baseball games I've seen in a while. Um, I want to start with the the umpire delay. The fact that you had a 45-minute just about delay because the umpire gets hit by a ball and has to tap out, which we've seen this happen before. This happened in 2021, I believe, when Arkansas was hosting Georgia, and it kind of flipped on Arkansas. Like they they didn't they, they kind of killed their momentum. I remember uh, this. The second base umpire took over behind home plate, but left his gear at the hotel, so there was like a huge delay. I thought that was kind of just that was just hilarious, and for a game that featured so much back and forth, weird calls, weird plays in the field, weird scoring decisions, big decisions for interim head coach Matt Hobbs to make. Like it was a chaotic game. Ha- throwing a 45 minute umpire delay in there is just perfect. I just love that. Um, but yeah, so you know Brady Tiger gets to start on the mound for Arkansas in this game too, and was entering this game with I think like a zero seven three ERA. It had been kind of lights out all year. Um, right away, Auburn jumps right on him. Cooper Weiss, who, weirdly enough, almost, I don't want to say almost came to Arkansas, but was definitely pursued by Arkansas in the portal. And then I think when they realized they were getting Vahiva, they kind of calmed down a little bit on that. But uh, he ends up going to Auburn. He's their shortstop leadoff guy. He hits a double right down the line, like to start in like the, like the second or third pitch of the game. Uh, steals third base on Tigert which he ended up doing a lot in this game. I believe he went three for four on stolen bases. Um, just another facet of how weird this game was. But he steals third and then gets driven in with a ground out. So Arkansas is down 1-0 like right off the bat. I mean, I know they batted in the top of the first. Uh, but Tiger, who had not really given up anything the last month, uh, immediately gives up a run. And you're like, okay, like is, is he going to settle in? Like He ended up getting the next two guys out. Seemed to be fine. Uh, ben McLaughlin goes ahead and ties the game with a home run in the top of the second they said it was there were there were two home runs hit by Arkansas in this game, both of which I feel like were grossly underestimated by the track man. They said Ben McLaughlin and Ryder Helfrich's home runs, which we'll get to later, were like 404, 405. I don't think Ben McLaughlin could hit a ball harder than he hit this ball. It was like a 2 2 fastball uh, from Arkansas or Auburn starter Chase Alsop, just right down the middle and a little bit elevated, and he just put a perfect swing on it. Absolute mash that one. Uh, so that was good to see Ben McLaughlin, who's not, you know, not the most toolsy, flashy power guy. He's had two big home runs the last two weekends. Really good to see that swing. Um, yeah, so then Parker Rowland got to start behind home plate and made two really bad throwing errors, uh, which I thought were interesting. Uh, and, like, I mean, not a, not a big deal, but he was trying to back pick someone at first base, which ended up allowing a runner at second to come around and score. That's how Auburn got back in front. And then... Uh, you know, so I guess they took a three to one lead in the third inning. That error kind of helped speed it up a little bit. But Tiger's outing, it wasn't bad, but it just like he was never able to settle in and like get a rhythm and just have a clean one, two, three, boom, we just get this guy out or never really get going, it felt like. So he ends up three and two thirds, gives up the three hits, three runs, walked five, which I believe is has to be a career and season high, struck out four. That'll raise his ERA to a whopping one five four, but yeah, they pulled him with 76 pitches and went to Cody Frank, who ended up getting them out of that inning. But it just wasn't it just wasn't his day. It just wasn't Brady Tiger's day. Um, but one thing I do want to point out, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this. Actually, I'll just talk about it now. I felt like this game, from a like competitiveness and like team chemistry standpoint, this game was the best I felt about this team all year. And part of that was just how much they were pulling for each other. You could tell how much they wanted to win. You know, it's back and forth. There was a lot of adversity, a lot of weird plays, Auburn scoring, them having to come back. There was a lot going on, but you could just see how much they were engaged, cheering for each other. The whole dugout was going crazy. But I remember when Ben McLaughlin made a huge defensive play, and he's coming off the field. I believe this is like the fifth or sixth inning. And Brady Tiger was one of the first dudes out of the dugout, dapping dudes up, you know, cheering on his teammates. I know that stuff, like I, people like to overrate this stuff sometimes. And I'm not trying to act like this is like the biggest deal in the world, but people sleep, man. I'm telling you, 
there are a lot of teams and a lot of players that we've all been around over the course of our, our time. Anybody who plays baseball knows some dudes like this who, if they had had the outing Tiger had, especially for a dude who's had a lot of success, so I'm sure he was super frustrated with the way his outing played out, the five walks. Like I said, wasn't able to really get it going. I know plenty of guys who would have just kind of stuck to themselves, not said much in the dugout, probably just taken a seat and probably just you know put on a bag of ice, done whatever, like kind of just been – a little woe is me type of mentality. That's what my, my head coach in high school used to say. Woe is me mentality. We don't want to have that. Uh, but I know a lot of guys who who might have done that. And even if they're not openly pouting, they probably also wouldn't be super hype man in the dugout who's banging on the drums and he's he's hyping his teammates up and dapping dudes up and putting the hog hat on him, putting the monkey hat on him, like doing all this stuff. I thought it was really cool to see Tiger doing that. Um, and I think that kind of stuff can take you a long way when your best players are the ones setting that tone. Uh, we've talked. I mean, they've, they've talked about it at length now. How Hagen is a as a team captain who doesn't really say much, kind of just sets that tone by example by the way he goes about it. Having your best players be your best leaders is always a good recipe. It's very rare that you have a team that has a lot of talent and the and they are player led and their leadership comes from their best players. It's rare that you see those teams just suck. Just doesn't really happen. And obviously, Arkansas, this team does not suck. Um, but moving on now to a little bit of like the actual intricacies of the game. So Cody Frank comes out of the bullpen for Tiger. Uh, the first pitch he throws, I believe, was lined to right field, and Kendall Diggs makes a nice little sliding catch, uh, which got, got Arkansas out of a little mini jam there, which I'm sure Brady Tiger really appreciated. Because um, you never – I mean, when you leave the game with runners on base as a pitcher, maybe I'm just a selfish guy when I was playing, but – I know I was sitting there looking. I'm like, looking at that next reliever. I'm like, you better not let those suckers score. <laughs> I do not want those on my line. And I know that pitchers at high level, whether they say it or not, they care about that stuff. Um, but I thought it was it was cool. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously joking here a little bit. I'm not saying Brady Tiger was looking at Cody Frank like, hey, you better. But, you know, he's able to get him out of that jam a little bit. Uh, wasn't the best outing from Cody Frank, who has been very reliable for Arkansas. I mean, I mentioned Will McIntyre. At one point, it seemed like they were kind of the two-headed monster of you know, your soft tossing righties who are going to come in and do all this pitch twice a weekend type of thing. Uh, Frank ends up going two innings, uh, gives up five hits, two runs, one of which was earned because you had another Parker roll and throwing error that allowed a run to score, struck out a couple. Um, 24 of his 32 pitches for strikes, which is interesting, but it wasn't like a peak Cody Frank outing. He's had a lot better, and he'll have a lot better down the stretch. Um, but I thought that was kind of like a, a tough way for the game to start where you have a weekend starter in Brady Tiger who's been lights out. He doesn't have his best stuff that day. And then you go to Cody Frank, who's able to stabilize it a little bit, but even he didn't have his best stuff. And so they go to Gage Wood with, I believe, two on and two out. And it might have been bases loaded. I can't remember exactly. Uh, but Gage Wood comes through with a big strikeout. And uh, I do also want to point out that Dave Van Horn, like we said, was at, back in Fayetteville with his family, as he should have been. Anybody that has a problem with that you should just shut up. Um, and I, don't, I haven't seen anybody complaining. I'm just saying, like, if you had a problem with it, shut up. Um, but anyways, Bra Dave Van Horn's in Fayetteville with his family. So for one game, Matt Hobbs was the acting head coach, which I don't know if anybody knew this. He was 0-1 as a head coach at the Division One level coming into this because he had to coach for Dave when he got food poisoning that one time. Uh, he got a salad. And uh, there's a lot we could there, there's a lot we could talk about there because there was a famous radio guy in the state of Arkansas who claimed that Dave Van Horn had cancer for some reason. That was a wild trip. Uh, but he, anyways, <laughs> Matt Hobbs had to coach for him in the SEC tournament for one game, and Arkansas lost that game. So this is a big revenge tour for Matt Hobbs this weekend. And it was kind of funny because Arkansas really, I mean, they they won one to nothing on Thursday, which was a close game, obviously. But there weren't a ton of massive decisions that needed to be made. You had Hagen Smith go six. You had Will McIntyre go two. And then you had to decide, do you roll with McIntyre or go to Gackle? That was really the only like big decision that needed to be made there. Um, this game on Friday where Matt Hobbs was the head coach, there was like 19 different massive decisions that the head coach had to make. And it's just funny because Arkansas really hadn't been in a game like that in a while. And coming into the weekend, that was one of my big questions of like, hey, how does Arkansas look? in adverse situations, when it's a close game, tightly contested. Like, that's when you find out about your team. Arkansas hadn't been in that situation in a while because, you know, Missouri, that series is pretty cut and dry. The McNeese series the week before was pretty cut and dry. Even the Murray State series wasn't super competitive. Like, the, the game three was pretty tight down the stretch, but it wasn't like a ton of back and forth. Do we go with this pitcher? Do we go with that guy? Like, it was pretty – there hadn't been a ton of situations like that for Arkansas. 
But I mentioned how he had to make the tough call of pulling Tiger at 76 pitches, which, you know, Tiger didn't protest the, him pulling him. I'm sure that he kind of understood it just wasn't his day or whatever. But he makes that call, goes to Cody Frank. It works out. He gets the line out. Then with two on, two out, you go to Gage Wood. Who out, we love Gage Wood here on this program. Yeah, I think he's done a, you know, he, he had a pretty nice outing the other day, actually. Um, but it's, again, it's, it's a guy who a lot of people weren't sure if they trusted him or not. I know I was kind of in that category where I was like, man, this is a big spot. Like, I hope he comes through here, but I wasn't super confident. They make that call, go to him. He gets a huge strikeout looking. That was massive. And then an inning later, Gage Wood runs into some trouble where he gives up an infield single. There's a little miscommunication. Uh, I think he might have hit a guy or something like that. So you have bases loaded, one out right off the bat. And uh, he goes to Stone Hewlett, who is basically, I mean, is Stone Hewlett the goat of left-on-left specialty situations let me read y'all this <laughs> let me read y'all this dude so he faced two batters this weekend struck them both out uh in this situation i'm talking about bases loaded one out auburn goes to a left-handed pinch hitter against gage wood so matt hobbs just says hey i'm bringing in my lefty stone hewlett who exists literally for this exact moment he gets a big punch out and uh you know i love that you know you pull stone hewlett after facing one batter he faced one batter struck him out and when he goes to get the ball from him, all the infielders were like clapping, like patting him on the back, like, you did your job. And I know that some people who don't follow baseball as much might be like, why the hell would you pull a pitcher and let a dude face one batter and then pull him? It's just how these things work, left-on-left left situation. You do what you got to do. Um, but you could tell that Hobbs appreciated it. The team appreciated what Stone Hewlett Hewlett did. Just one out, but that's a massive out. And... Frankly, Arkansas doesn't win that game if he doesn't get that out. I'll just go ahead and say that now. Uh, that's not even a controversy because they the bases were loaded with one out. They end up winning by one run. Like Obviously, if he didn't get that job done, they were going to be in trouble. Uh, they go to Cooper Dossett. Again, another massive decision. Another guy who, good stuff, has had some good moments this year. We feel good, but it's like we haven't seen him in this situation where it's bases loaded, two out, SEC weekend, high leverage, go see if you can get it done. Uh, and he gets the ground out, which went to Ben McLaughlin, who, you know, kind of it was a hard hit ball. He kind of bobbles it right away and it starts bouncing into foul territory. And you're looking, you're like, oh man, it's going to end up being an E3. Like, this is a tough one. He picks it up and just dives at the bag and gets the play just in time. Unreal stuff, huge moment. And uh, again, I talk about how, like, I think that's actually the moment when Tiger came out and was dapping him up. But that was one of those moments where it's like you could see the competitive nature of this team and how badly they wanted to win each weekend and that's one thing I appreciate about Dave Van Horn's teams even in his absence when he's there with his family is they take everything personally you know if you bat flip against them they don't I mean you know they're not gonna like fight you over it but they take note of that and they don't say anything they just go back and they're gonna get you back they're gonna beat you and then they'll celebrate afterwards uh, but they take every single series personally they take every single game personally they're living and dying with every pitch, which is what you want. <laughs> Curtis just Curtis just came up to the window and did a little did a little hard. I thought he when he was coming over here, I was like, crap, some portal pop just happened and he's he needs the studio. Crap, I'm gonna have to get out of here now. Uh thank God it's not that. But uh they take every game so serious. Like, you know, that's what made that 2021 team so fun to watch, is obviously they won every series, and you could tell that they wanted to win every series, which sure, you want to win every game you play. But with some teams, you can just tell they wanted a little bit more than their opponent. And I felt like in that Saturday or that Friday game, that game two, it kind of, I'm not trying to be cliche here and be like, hey, Arkansas wanted it more. That's why they won. But I think that competitive spirit and that fire and that personality of this team is starting to show a little bit. And me personally, I'm having a lot of fun watching it. It's been cool to see that. Uh, so like I said, Cooper Dossett comes in, gets the big out, comes back the next inning, retires a side in order. Uh, that's actually not true. He walked the dude, but he, you know, retired the side, gets out of it. Um, no issues. Really productive outing from him. Uh, his next outing did not go as well. Um, but then you have Will McIntyre comes in and closes the game, and he closed the game after Ryder Helfrich, who, again, had not been – I mentioned him on, I guess, Wednesday's podcast. I was saying, I think you're going to see Ryder Helfrich this weekend. I thought he would get the starting nod in game two. He did not, but – they went to a pinch hitter. They pinch hit Souza for Roland because, uh, you know, you had Hudson White DH and, uh, and normally Souza's at DH. But H H Hudson White, who's been catching and done, doing a good job, had a really productive weekend. He uh, was DHing this day. So you had Roland catching. You bring in Souza to pinch hit. 
and bring in Helfrich to play defense afterwards because obviously Nolan Souza, love the kid, great athlete. He ain't, he ain't going to be stay behind the plate. Uh, so he had to bring in Helfrich, and then uh, Matt Hobbs was talking about it after the game that he said they kind of liked the matchup, and they were kind of considering, like, oh, hey, do we need to bring in another pinch hitter? Like, what's going on? It's a tie game here in the top of the ninth. And Ryder Helfrich hit this ball as hard as a human being can hit a ball. It was 109 off the bat. And, again, they claimed 404. I'm calling BS. Matt Hobbs was calling BS after the game. He's like, bro, it was not 404 feet. It was a lot longer than that. Um, but that was kind of like the moment of the weekend. I mean, that clip was just all over social media. I was seeing every single baseball account ever. Like, you know, Barstool was tweeting about it. You're like 11.7. Like those guys, they were tweeting about it. D1 Baseball. Like all these huge accounts were all being like, wow, look at this freshman. And, you know, a Butch, Butch Thompson, Auburn's head coach afterwards was like, man, Everybody in the country recruited that kid, man. He's going to be a special freshman for them, um, and he's right. Uh, and he, you know, this is why we still. I told, I told, I don't know if I said it on the podcast or on a on a separate outlet somewhere else where I was saying, do not sell your Ryder Helfrich stock just yet. He's going to have a lot of special moments in his Arkansas career. That was really cool to see. And he obviously dyed his hair blonde recently. I don't know if anyone noticed that. So uh, maybe he's the blonde bomber. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, it was really cool to see a freshman come off the bench, make a huge moment in that game. And the theme here with this Friday game and why I'm sitting here taking 20 minutes to talk about it so long is because there were so many huge moments from so many different characters, so many pitchers that came in and got their job done, so many hitters that came off the bench and got a job done. Nolan Souza comes off and pinch hits and strikes out. But, like, it was a full team effort. Will Edmondson, got to mention that dude because he got a couple starts in left field this week. Had a massive, massive two-run single uh, after a, after an Auburn error that really turned the tide in the game and ended up kind of being the difference. Uh, you know, so many different people made plays in this game to help Arkansas win. It was like as well-rounded a team performance as I think you can have. Uh, there were so many close plays, so many plays that went to review, you know, controversial things going on, close double plays, close plays at first. Uh, the umpires maybe missed a tag because Ryder Helfrick, I should mention, came off the bench and was playing catcher. Also threw out Cooper Weiss. That's what it was. Uh, I, I just now remember, I was wondering, I was like, I saw this walk on Cooper Dawson's line, but I didn't remember it. That's that's how it played out. So Cooper Dawson issues a leadoff walk in the eighth inning. And then Helfrick, and it, it was to Cooper Weiss, Auburn's leadoff guy, their guy who had three stolen bases in this game. He tries to steal second, and Ryder Helfrich just guns him down. Uh, he may have slid in under the tag, but Auburn had already used up all their challenges because they had – Butch Thompson loves to challenge, like, every call that he does. He was, he was arguing balls and strikes and, like, asking for a review at one point. And I love Butch Thompson. I respect what he's done. That's actually just, like, not allowed. Like, I, I'm not saying he needed to be ejected, but, like, it's in the rules. You're not allowed to argue balls and strikes as a coach. It's just a thing. If you argue balls and strikes, like, it'll give you, like, a little warning, but you can get tossed for that. Uh, he was, like, asking for a review on a close <laughs> close ball four that Auburn threw, and it's like, that's just not how this works, man. I don't know how he didn't understand that's not how that works, but uh, anyways, he had used up all his challenges, so he wasn't able to challenge that huge play in the top of the – or in the bottom of the eighth inning. Um then the next pitch is when the umpire delay happened. And I want to give Cooper Dawson credit because this is a dude who th he's, he has like nine career innings under his belt. Um, he obviously was thrown into a big situation in the inning before, comes back and issues a walk and then gets that big out. Um, but the umpire delay, he comes back after it and gets two other outs and strikes out a dude to finish his outing. Like that's big time stuff. That sh that's like stuff that earns you more opportunities. And he did earn another opportunity and he – didn't make the most of it the next day. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But I just thought like that was a really impressive performance from him and just all in together. I mean, again, I'm just talking about the team aspect here where you have Dossett comes in and he gets a huge defensive play from Ben McLaughlin. Ryder Helfrick throws a dude out. He comes back at a delay and gets a strikeout. It's like this is a full team effort here, and that's what I really liked about that game. And uh, just seeing like the full roster come together and band together and just everyone doing their part. That kind of stuff, just like as a purist, as a like sports fan, as a sports observer, like that kind of stuff just really is fun to watch. And uh, I just, I loved it, man. I could not, I, I might, uh, from, shout out to my boy Stu Hall, Corey Stewart. Uh, he does the highlight videos on YouTube. If you've ever missed any game, go check out his channel because he posts these little like eight to 10 minute highlight videos of each win. 
I might go back and watch that one as soon as I get done with that one, just because it was so much fun. Um, but yeah, so Arkansas comes through with a big game two win to secure the series. And uh, I spent so much time talking about game two that I'm not going to talk about game three nearly as much. Uh, but shit kind of hit the fan for Arkansas in this one. Uh, I want to point out here, so Mason Molina goes five innings, three hits, one run. Right there, like just those three things I just read you, you're like, okay, great outing, right? Four strikeouts on top of it is fine. He walks four. And he throws 74 pitches total. So, like, you know, if they needed him for another inning, they probably could have done it. But on short rest, up a day, uh, I, I could see why they didn't, especially because he kind of lost it there in those last couple innings. Like, those worst, he was, it seemed like it was getting worse for him. Um, so you kind of, I don't want to say squander a good outing, but it's like it could have been a much better outing. And Van Horn kind of spoke about some of his frustrations with it too. And, look, I'm not, I'm, we're nitpicking Mason Molina because he is very good. Same with Brady Tiger. We're nitpicking these guys because of how good they were. And same thing, same reason people nitpicked. I used to make fun of people who would nitpick Hagen Smith, but like the reason they did it is because you have the standards so high when you're that good. Um, I was a little just disappointed that considering how well Mason was throwing early and just how much momentum ha- Arkansas had after winning that those first two games, especially in the way they did it. Arkansas jumps out to a four nothing lead, and Mason Molina's cooking on the mound. It's like you'd really like for him to just go ahead and get through six innings, keep this Auburn lineup in check, and not give them an opening to work their way back in the game. Felt like he kind of did that, issued the four walks. Uh, 44 of his 74 pitches for strikes, which is above 50%, but like just a lot lower than you're looking for out of like a legit weekend starter. Uh, in the future, Like I'm not, I'm not going to make a huge deal about it. It's just kind of a thing that happened. But I think you see just how the, the the margin for error is not that big in this league. And I think Brady Tiger not getting through four innings and Mason Molina only getting through five sort of put Arkansas in a bad spot. And I feel like that's what kind of contributed to them blowing it down the stretch here. I mentioned Dossett, who had the awesome outing the day before. They try to bring him back and immediately gives up a nuke, just left a slider right over the plate. Uh, I believe it was Ike Irish that hit it. Uh, actually, I'm lying. It was Cooper McMurray, who had a rough weekend, but uh, he got got a pitch to hit against Dossett and cranks it out. Uh, I believe the next guy hit like a double after that. And so they go to Gabe Gackle, who also really just didn't have it. And he pitched really well on Thursday night. It immediately gives up an extra base hit, walks two dudes, and just kind of didn't look like Gabe Gackle. My question is, this was in the sixth inning when this happened. Uh, they, you know, Because obviously Molina goes through five. They go immediately to Dossett, who doesn't get an out, allows the first two guys he faces to reach, and they pull him. And then Gackle comes through and allows the first three guys he faces to reach. Um, my question is, like, what was going to happen if Gackle did pitch well? Like, Colin Fisher ended up throwing two and two-thirds kind of once once Arkansas had lost the lead. Uh, I guess he kind of helped them lose it. But I'm just, like, wondering if they were expecting Gackle to throw four innings there. Like, I really don't know how Arkansas was planning on closing the game. It was also 5-2 to two at the time. So maybe they're thinking, hey, if we just throw Gackle now and we get through, maybe they'll build a lead and then we can go to someone else. I don't know. Um, but I again, I think that part of – and then look, I don't really care that much, honestly. I'm not, like, losing sleep over this, this game three loss. But I think that what led to it is what concerns me a little bit, which is Tiger not having his best stuff and them having to kind of piece together that game two left them a little bit shorthanded for game three. And again, Mason Molina, if he's able to get through six – Maybe you just feel a little bit differently about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, Dawson and Gackle didn't get an out, which is disappointing. You don't want to see two of your better arms come in there and just not have it and not get anyone out. And it kind of just snowballed on them. But uh, it looked like – so Colin Fisher comes in with, I believe it was second and third, one out, and gets a strikeout right off the bat. And you're kind of like, oh, man, Arkansas is going to get through this this whole situation. Like, they're going to end up making it work. And uh, then he just gives up. By the way, I want to go back in time. I said Cooper McMurray was the one that hit the home run off Cooper Dossett. I was wrong. It was Mason Manners who actually gave Arkansas a lot of trouble in that series. Auburn has a lot of players who are like just sneaky good, man. Um, but anyways, it was Cooper McMurray who hit the three-run home run with two outs after Bobby Pierce struck out. And you're like, oh, man, Arkansas is going to get through this. It's still, I believe at this point, it was like five to four. And then they gave up a three-run home run, and it's just a gut punch. And you kind of knew right then. You're like, man. When you give up six runs in an inning, it's hard to overcome that. Arkansas made a little push late, but they were not able to overcome it. Um, and i got to say, I, I was actually pretty impressed with the way that 
Fisher bounced back and was able to give Arkansas a couple more innings after that. Um, but, you know, it just wasn't an ideal situation for him to be thrown in. wasn't an ideal situation for Dawson and Gackle to have to come back for the second time and clearly just didn't have it. A uh, little bit tough. You know, we can argue about why it happened, if it's a big deal, like how concerned we are moving forward. But to me, it just kind of comes down to the starting rotation, which we held, hold in such high regard for very good reason. Them not being able to kind of do their part is what I think led to some of this. Um, but look, I think that ultimately – Wrapping this all up in a weird, chaotic fashion here, I kind of rambled a little bit. But wrapping this all up, Arkansas's team, I feel good about all the pieces. And, uh, you know, that includes the bullpen, starting rotation, even the lineup, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about here in a second. Um, but I think one of the big questions I had going into the weekend is just, what do these guys look like in this setting? And uh, we got some answers. We saw some guys rise to the occasion. Uh, Stone Hewlett's one that I'm like, really, I'm pumped about his two strikeouts. I feel like he's. He's got a chance to really help this staff in a big way. Um, I, I really like seeing Cooper Dossett get out there, and I'll, I'll be interested. I mean, he had a rough outing on Saturday. I think he'll, he, he's going to bounce back from that. I, I look forward to seeing his next outing. Um, Gackles kind of kind of gave you some Jacqueline Hyde there. Really good on Thursday, not as good on Saturday. We'll see how he bounces back. But I just think overall it was very good for Arkansas to play in a series like this. One, on the road, we were kind of wondering how this team would look in this kind of setting, we're just, you know, we just hadn't seen it yet. So it was good to see that. But three games in this series that were all really competitive, all really close, I feel like that does nothing but make your team feel a little bit better. And and like I was saying on on Wednesday, it's just you don't know until you put them out there. You don't know how Cooper Dawson is going to handle SEC road situation until you throw them out there. I feel like Arkansas was able to get some of their better, most important pitchers on the mound in some big moments and they had some ups and downs, and so you can kind of move forward from there. But I just feel like for this coaching staff, it's 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 nice that they were able to see some of these developments and kind of know what you got with some of these pieces. And even though it didn't go well for Gackle and Dawson on Saturday, I still think they kind of know how they feel about this bullpen and what the hierarchy is. And we'll see how they go about it moving forward and if it changes. But we got to talk a little bit about the offense because I continue to just be like pretty underwhelmed by Arkansas's bats. Um, I'm not like panicking. I'm not like super concerned where I'm like, hey, they got to do something. Like, what's going on? Um, they're tenth. They're tied with tied for Ole Miss and for tenth in the SEC in batting average. They're eleventh in slugging. They're thirteenth in OBP, which really is the the number that kind of sticks out to me. Where I'm like, how is this team thirteenth in OBP? Like, typically Arkansas, even if they're not hitting super well, is drawing walks, getting hit by pitch, making dudes work. Um, the interesting thing is Arkansas doesn't strike out like nearly as much as I kind of expected them to, and I think we've kind of grown accustomed to here in Fayetteville. Arkansas is dead last in the SEC, which is a good thing, in strikeouts at 41, but they're tied or they're 12th in walks. Um, I just, I, It's very interesting to me. I feel like, especially since we're doing this whole gorilla ball bit, you would think there would be a little bit more juice at the plate and maybe there would be some swing and miss. Uh, now, I do need to point out that Arkansas's pitching staff dropped to second in strikeouts after the final two games of the series, LSU now leads the SEC in strikeouts on the year overall. I believe an SEC play Arkansas is still up there, maybe. But uh, so this is a big test for Arkansas's bats coming up this weekend in terms of I just said they're like they don't strike out a ton and they walk a lot. Well, LSU strikes out people and they also walk people, so it's like I feel like there's some regression to the mean coming or some progression to the mean, however you want to look at it. Um, but I'm still just kind of waiting for it to click for this offense a little bit. And uh, just in SEC play alone, I wanted to pull up some numbers here. Arkansas is 12th in the SEC in batting average in SEC play, which is only six games, still a pretty small sample size. Uh, they're seventh in slugging, which I mean, I talked about that a lot last week after the Missouri series that I was like pretty encouraged by what Arkansas was able to do slugging-wise. Uh, on base percentage, Arkansas is a little bit they're, – they're not as bad as – I mean, 13th overall in the SEC, 11th in SEC play. Um, scoring Arkansas is like right in the middle of the pack at eighth. Um, again, it's like they're not bad offensively, but it's just been a little ho hum, a little bit just eh, they're all right. Um, and you see like the vision, like Kendall Diggs, for example, had he was hitless in the first two games, and then he has two massive hits in game three. Uh, Peyton Stowell has been pretty consistent. Vahiva Aloy is obviously an up and down guy. Um, Hudson White, who had a really good weekend, he's been some a little bit up and down. So it's like. It feels like they have an issue of getting all these pieces 
to click at the same time. And weirdly enough, game three, the game Arkansas lost, is the game they had 10 hits in where everyone except McLaughlin, who walked three times, got a hit. Um, so it's like there's like little moments here and there where you're like, oh, I see the vision one through nine. Like this, this team's they're really making you work, and they're awesome. I don't know. I just don't think opponents fear this Arkansas lineup the way that you would think they would and the way that they have in years past. And it's a little concerning to me. I got to be honest. Like I just I'm, I'm waiting for that explosion to happen, and it just hasn't really happened yet. Um, but there are some promising pieces. I do want to point out a few little stats here. So Kendall Diggs is hitting, uh, I believe it's like 236 in SEC play at the plate, but his six hits are two home runs, two doubles, and a triple. So he's slugging 615. Kendall Diggs is a stud. You should not be worried about him. You shouldn't be worried about Peyton Stovall. Um, I do want to talk about Ben McLaughlin and his insane, like what he's doing in SEC play. Again, it's just kind of kind of weird. So he's hitting 222. And so you're like, okay, what's, you know, not hitting great. Only, I guess, what is that? Four for 18. But he's slugging 556. He's got the two home runs. And his on base percentage is 423, which is a very good number because he's walked seven times, only struck out once in SEC play. Love that from Penn McLaughlin. Love that stuff. Um, Vahiva Loy, by the way, I want to just, just do a quick little vibe check on Vahiva. So I tweeted uh, after a home run, he hit a home run on Thursday, which ended up being the only run in that game. So, you know, if you're if you're displeased with Vahiva Aloy's offense, at least you can credit one win to him. Arkansas, you know, would have had a lot tougher situation trying to win that game had he not hit that home run. So good, good for them. Uh, but Vahiva is now hitting 247 on the year. So I know some people are going to be kind of underwhelmed by that, and they're like, oh, hey, he just hasn't been great. In SEC plays in 286, uh, slugging 571. He's also only struck out twice in SEC play, which is kind of stunning to me. Three walks, two hit by pitches, uh, and two strikeouts for Vahiva Loy. I also feel like, I mean, he's got the two home runs. I feel like he's due for a little bit more power. I mean, he's got four home runs now in the year. I think you're going to keep seeing that coming. I've been kind of saying it for a while, and it's been continuing to build a little bit. I feel very good about where Vahiva's headed offensively in the middle of that lineup. And I also, I tweeted out the other day when he hit a home run, and I said, this is another rough day for the Vahiva Loy haters. And some of you listening may think, oh, yeah, I agree. Like, there are no Vahiva Loy haters because that's what some people were tweeting at me. I don't know, man. There, I remember when I was tweeting about Vahiva Loy earlier in the year and people were, like, really disgruntled, same as they were with Caleb Cali, where everybody hated him for a few weeks there. People were definitely anti Vahiva Loy, and I'm sure some of you still are. So I'd love to if – you, if you are anti Vahiva Loy, I want to hear from you in the comments just so I can – just so I can dance on your grave as he continues to build uh, what I believe is going to end up being a very solid season. And the next year I think is going to be even more special. But uh, I feel like, I feel like we've kind of come full circle now where I think most people understand what Vahiva Loy is, which is a very high value, like high risk, high reward offensive player who for the most part is going to do enough damage. And at shortstop, man, he's been awesome. Doesn't have an error in SEC play. He's been way more consistent than I would have guessed, but, you know, just good to see that kind of stuff happening there. Um, I mean, guys, I, I, I overall, right, we're, we're really wrapping it up now. We're, we're almost to the hour mark, so I'm going to have to get out of here now. Um, not that it really matters, but wrapping it all up big picture. Uh, let me guys, let me, I keep saying, let me guys know what you think. Let me know what you guys think in the comments about just Arkansas's weekend this 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 past weekend in Auburn. Uh, they win two out of three, and I know that you know it's hard to complain about winning two out of three, especially on the road in the SEC whenever no one else seems to be able to do that. Nobody can go on the road and win. Um, but I can. I also understand that some of you probably are a little underwhelmed, especially by this offense, and I wonder if this bullpen collapse on Saturday maybe makes you a little concerned. I would uh, err on the side of not being concerned about the pitching side of things for sure just based on the fact that Arkansas has got like the best ERA in the country and the best ERA in SEC play by a full run and a half. And that really the Saturday was the first kind of kink in the armor that we've seen. Um, but yeah, just let me know what you think. I think offensively, I still have some questions. So I know you guys probably have some questions too. And I want to hear them. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of challenging, not, not challenging. I've been done that a few times now, but I want to see this offense really explode. And if they don't, we'll just reevaluate where we're at. Um, I do also want to point out, I meant to bring this up on a podcast like a week ago. I, I went back and looked. In 2017, 
Florida won the national title with a 259 team batting average. And if you watched them in the postseason that year, it seemed worse than that. Like they were really struggling to scape, scrape runs together, but they had a starting rotation of Alex Fiedo, uh, Brady Singer, remember him, and Jackson Kowar, who also pitched in the big leagues, like three big league level arms, and they were able to make it work and piece it together. I'm not saying that's what this Arkansas team is, but I think at some point, if they just continue to be ho-hum offensively in 10th, 11th in the SEC in every category, we might just have to reevaluate what this team is. Not saying they can't win the national title with this current offense, but I going into the offseason, I didn't view it as Arkansas is going to live and die with their pitching staff and they're going to win all these two-to-one games. I thought this team would be able to hit a little bit and have some juice. Uh, so if it's there, I'd like to see it soon. Would be nice. I mean, you, you hit a few home runs against Missouri, cool, but – Let's uh let's let's get this thing going on a more consistent basis. Uh, I feel like they're making some strides, but still not quite where they want to be and where we want them to be offensively. Um, I really don't want to view this team like that, where it's like, hey, they just can't hit, and we'll just see if they can out pitch folks. Uh, but I don't know. What do you guys think? Let me know. And uh, I appreciate you guys for letting me ramble here on this program today. Uh, like I said, be sure to subscribe, like, do whatever you got to do to help support this channel. Tell your friends about it. And uh, if you're listening and you're not subscribed, come on. Go ahead and subscribe now. Let's go ahead and get this going. Uh, be sure to also check us out, nattystatesports.com. We've got some great written content going on. We will be back with some of that. I'm about to actually post a story uh, for our from our newest intern, Parker Harrison, who is going to preview tomorrow's midweek matchup a little bit. And he'll probably be back with a preview of LSU later in the week. Looking forward to that. We will be back here on, I believe, Wednesday to preview the LSU series. And uh, I'll just go ahead and say it. The ball is in Peyton Holt's court. I have reached out to try, and I want, I want to talk to Peyton Holt. He's the, he's the guy. He's like, whenever I started this podcast, he was kind of in mind of, like, someone I want to interview because I know he's got a great personality. It would be great to hear from. So uh, I just want to let you guys know, the ball is in his court. Uh, if you have to yell at him, if you see Peyton Holt at the grocery store, be like, hey, man, go on the Bob Bestick podcast. You got to do that. Uh, I saw – shout out. I forget who it was, so I'm sorry if I'm blanking right now. Uh, who was it? Somebody was tweeting at me. What? I, I God dang it! I, I wish I had the name. I wish I had it pulled up and was prepared. But someone tweeted that and was like, "Hey, you need to get Ben McLaughlin on the podcast." I appreciate stuff like that. I'm not saying you need to be tweeting at these dudes and be like, "Hey, go go do it." But hey, any kind of get the ball rolling, put the ball in their court. I want I want the players to know if you need to tell your story, this is where you tell it. And uh, I know you guys would love hearing from some of those. I know we had great. Reactions to the Nolan Susan and Jason Jones interview has been cool to hear from those guys. Uh, so I know you guys are, are probably wanting to hear another guest. I'd like to set it up soon. We'll try to get something going there. But we've had a lot going on here at Natty State HQ, so uh, forgive me a little bit. But, again, guys, I'm, I'm signing out now for real. Appreciate you guys letting me ramble for over an hour. And uh, like I said, continue supporting what we do. I will see you on Wednesday.